We took a shuttle and we went to the seventh moon of Eridani D. I recall to experience a book exchange, an ancient human ritual. This gift comes with a mother's advice. Hey, Star Trek book fans, Dan Gunther here. Welcome to another edition of the Treklet Report, where I do a review of one of the latest Star Trek novels to be released by Simon & Schuster. This week, we are talking about Star Trek Discovery, The Enterprise War by John Jackson Miller. The Enterprise War is the fifth and latest installment in the Star Trek Discovery book series. It follows the adventures of the USS Enterprise under Captain Christopher Pike, and specifically what she was up to during Discovery's first season. You'll remember, of course, that the series focused on the Klingon War, and uh, Discovery's role in that conflict, but what was the Enterprise and Captain Pike up to? Now, interestingly, this period of time takes place over the course of just over one year, so this book actually covers quite a bit of time. Now, for those of you who are new to my book review videos, the first half of this video will be, of course, spoiler free, uh, at which time I will give a warning and get into spoilers for the second half of the video. So don't worry, you will be warned. The Enterprise is on a mission to survey a nebula called the Pergamum, and this is kind of an area of space that's very treacherous, uh, it's very difficult to navigate, and ships have been lost here over the years. Captain Pike learns of the outbreak of the Klingon War, decides to stop the mission, and heads the Enterprise home. However, upon leaving the Pergamum and establishing contact with Starfleet Command, they are ordered by Admiral Tural, who you may remember from Season 1 of Discovery, to return to their mission and to be held in reserve, not to join the fight against the Klingons. Pike bristles against this order, but ultimately does follow it, and events in the novel over the course of the year and a bit more uh, serve to keep Pike and the Enterprise in the nebula and away from the fighting. While Pike is trying to take the Enterprise out of the nebula in the first place, they have a kind of chance encounter with what they believe is a photon torpedo fired at them, and this kind of kicks off uh, an adventure with one group that we think is the enemy, and then later on that evolves into a different group being the actual antagonists of the story. There's some interesting tie-ins to Season 2 of Discovery, obviously, with Pike and his crew. Uh, I will say a lot of the characters that we get in Season 2 get fleshed out in this story in unexpected ways, which is fun and interesting. Uh, especially, I would say, Lieutenant Connolly, who was the science officer who met a very untimely demise in the Season 2 premiere of Discovery, gets an interesting story arc in this novel. So uh, it's it's kind of worth it to learn more about these characters as well. Commander Nan is another one that we're familiar with from the show that we learn a little bit more about in this novel. There are also references to characters from books and uh, series outside of the uh, Star Trek Discovery television show, and John Jackson Miller's actually bringing in sources from, you know, other novels. There's characters from Vulcan's Glory, uh, another novel featuring Pike and, and that sort of thing. We also get a little bit of Pike's backstory in his youth at the beginning of the novel, which reminds me a little bit of the novel Burning Dreams, where we got a lot of Pike's youth as well. Spock, of course, also plays a large role in the story and gets a significant character arc. And also number one, one of my favorite characters, Commander Una, played by Rebecca Romaine in Discovery and Majel Barrett in the original series pilot, The Cage. All in all, I'd say this is a very excellent addition to the Simon & Schuster Star Trek line. I really love this novel. I think it may be my favorite of the novels to be released so far this year. I would definitely give it a full 5 out of 5. Uh, it definitely is interesting to learn about the exploits of the Enterprise and get that side of the story, which of course we didn't get in Discovery. So it really does fill that out and actually connects to Season 2 of Discovery in some surprising ways, which I'll get into in the spoiler side of things as well. So uh, I think personally the, the Discovery novels are 5 for 5 so far. This is the fifth Star Trek Discovery novel and all five of them have been excellent and uh, this one may be my favorite so far. We've also learned that John Jackson Miller is writing another Star Trek Discovery novel that will be released sometime next year. Uh, we don't have a title for that one yet, but if uh, he brings the talent to that one that he did to this one, I think we're in for a really interesting story.
All right, as promised, we're now getting into the spoiler side of the review. So if you haven't read the book yet, you may want to stop here, pick up your copy and give it a read. If you don't care about spoilers, then by all means, watch on. So early on in this novel, the first group that we uh, that appear to be the antagonists are the Lurians. And if that name sounds familiar, you might recognize it as Morn's race. Morn, of course, the talkative bar fly from Star Trek Deep Space Nine. His people play a role in this, and specifically one Lurian, the commander of a pirate ship named Baladon, uh, who commands a group of Lurians who seem rather slow, with Baladon kind of being the only one who has any kind of uh, ambition or brain power behind him. And uh, they very quickly try to capture the Enterprise. As I said, they're pirates, so they're looking for treasure to plunder and that sort of thing. Uh, but they are unsuccessful. They themselves get captured by a group called the Boundless. Now, the Boundless end up being the true antagonists of the story. They're, they have some very interesting backstory here. They... Uh, constantly battle against an enemy within the Pergamum Nebula. Now, in order to fill out their troops, they actually capture the crews of passing ships and draft them into their army. They have this technology, these battle suits that they force people into, and the battle suits basically take over every function, autonomic, uh, waste extraction, uh, feeding, medication, all that sort of stuff. And the people never leave their battle suits. And that goes for the people they conscript as well as the native races that make up the boundless as well. And uh, they fight their enemy called the Rengru, who are kind of these like arthropod, insectoid type creatures and uh, they, they sound quite terrifying when they're first described. Basically, they capture about 30 members of the Enterprise crew off the surface of a planet that the uh, Enterprise crew is surveying. Among these, of course, is uh, Science Officer Spock and uh, Lieutenant Evan Connolly, who I mentioned before as well, as well as a number of other crew members. They're quickly assigned to roles such as, you know, frontline warriors who have to battle these Rengru, but Spock is able to kind of make deals and get them taken off the front line. All the while, Spock, of course, is trying to make contact with Rengru and avoid fighting them. The captain who captures the Enterprise crew is named Cormagan, and this is another very interesting character. She leads her faction of the Boundless and kind of controls uh, basically a, a regiment of this army. And... She's a very interesting character. She's kind of a true believer in this war and uh, is one of the native species that has been fighting this war for a very long time. And uh, it's interesting to see her kind of ideology play out here. Their way of looking at the universe is very alien to ours. They understand that they're taking away the freedoms of the people they capture, but still expect them to give themselves fully to the cause. And those that do so do find themselves advancing in rank. And this is where we bring back Baladon of the Lurians, who is definitely one of these kind of new converts who believes wholeheartedly in the mission and has really taken to his new role as a member of this army. As I mentioned, Lieutenant Connolly has an interesting arc in this story, and you kind of see him go from how he is at the beginning of this novel and really turns into the character that we see in that first episode of season two of Discovery, Brother. He's not exactly what I expected. I remember very much not liking him in that Discovery episode, and that's by design. He was written to be an unlikable character. But uh, the arc that he has in this is really interesting to see him go from where he was to what he becomes. And he really kind of finds this sort of strength, I guess you can call it, but also that arrogance that we see in Brother. We see how that kind of develops and how that manifests itself in this novel. Meanwhile, of course, the Enterprise is trying to get their people back and uh, they go through some very interesting adventures. There's one particular scene, I guess, that's very uh, effective. In the course of uh, one of the battles with the Boundless and the Rengru, the Enterprise has to do an emergency saucer separation and the two parts of the ship are separated. The saucer section crash lands on a planet and upside down <laughs> on kind of a sea of methane. 
and to see how they get out of this situation and the kind of machinations they manage to do to extricate themselves. That was a really fun and interesting engineering challenge. Speaking of engineering challenges, there's another great character, Galagian, who is the chief engineer of the Enterprise. And he has a really great character arc as well. He starts out as kind of a desk bound um, professor, theoretical type engineer who's been assigned to, assigned to the Enterprise. And he really doesn't have a grasp of the practical side of engineering or what serving on a starship really entails and, and the difficulties that arise from that. And over the course of the novel, with Captain Pike's guidance and, uh, you know, some kind of deep introspection and, and figuring things out about himself, he's able to really grow into that role and become a really great character who, of course, comes up with some great ideas to help save the day and implements other people's ideas to save the Enterprise. I also really appreciated a lot of the links to other novels and other kind of books in the Star Trek universe. Uh, Titan Absent Enemies, there's kind of an interesting uh, tie that we learn at the end of this novel into that e-novella that John Jackson Miller wrote for the Star Trek Titan series. It's one I'm going to have to definitely go back and reread now and kind of uh, see that link play out. That book also features the Lurians, and uh, if you haven't checked that out, uh, there's a review on my website. I'll link that in the description below. You can check that out. Other little continuity touches that I really appreciated, at the very end of the novel, we get kind of a direct lead-in to season two of Discovery. You might remember in the episode, If Memory Serves, there's a scene that shows a flashback to Spock mind-melding with the Red Angel, and we see that encounter in this novel. And it's one of those things where uh, I wasn't expecting it to go there because I hadn't really thought it through, but he's on a snow planet and things start to seem familiar and then you kind of realize what's about to happen and it has that direct link into the Red Angel story. And the very end of the book leads right into season two with Starfleet detecting the seven signals and assigning Pike to find out what the heck they're all about which of course uh, is where we find him when he rendezvous with the discovery at the end of season one and the very beginning of season two there is of course a final reveal about the true nature of the rain grew and the fight between them and the boundless which i won't reveal everything here um, it's a very Star Trek ending. It's something that, like, you know, I knew there had to be a twist of some kind, but I didn't figure out exactly what it was. And I think it's very well handled. It had me kind of guessing to the end exactly what the whole uh, reason behind this war would be. And in the end, the title, The Enterprise War, really works because at one point it seems that the Boundless and the Rengar are kind of fighting over the Enterprise. Uh, at, and, uh, of course, the role that the Enterprise crew plays in the war as well really turns it into a conflict that, uh, like I said, it takes place over the course of more than a year and really is an important um, event in the lives of the Enterprise crew. This could have actually made a really interesting entire season of episodes. Uh, it's, it's kind of that big, that expansive of a story. The book definitely suffices. It's a lot of fun, a really great read. Like I said, five out of five. Really enjoyed this one. Can't wait to see what John Jackson Miller comes up with uh, for his next novel. Uh, but in the meantime, we've got a bunch of other novels coming. I, of course, have recently read the original series novel, The Antares Maelstrom by Greg Cox. I'll have a re review of that shortly as well. We've got a couple other novels coming in the meantime, another Discovery novel towards the end of the year. We've also got the 40th anniversary edition of Star Trek The Motion Picture, which I will definitely have to cover. Uh, I have read that years ago. I do enjoy that novelization, so I'm going to be doing a review of that as well. And then, of course, in the new year, we have the Star Trek Picard novel, by uh, Una McCormick and I should also say another next generation novel later this year by David Max so definitely a lot of novels on the horizon look for reviews of all of those from me I'm really looking forward to those uh, Bruce Gibson and I actually had the chance to talk to John Jackson Miller about the Enterprise War on the Literary Treks podcast here's a quick look at that I kept seeing a blend of the Anson Mount and the cage portrayal of 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 Pike throughout this book. And I thought it blended real well together. Yeah. I mean, yeah, if we look at it, there's this, there's this, um, there's this gradation that goes on in the book. He loses one person in the prologue. 
he loses three people on Rigel 7. He loses 30 people in the second section. He loses 100 people uh, or something like that, or 70 odd. Uh, so it, his losses continue to, no pun intended, mount. Uh, and, then, and then, and then, uh, and then we 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 basically bury him uh, on this on this planet where he has no choice but to face these things. By all right, we're just going to have to pull ourselves up and and you know flip the ship over and 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 do what we need. To <laughs> oh, I love to that part. Out. That ship flipping. So check out that episode of Literary Treks. You can find that wherever you get your podcasts. I'll also have a link to that in the description below. But I also want to hear from you. Have you read The Enterprise War? And if so, what did you think? Leave a comment in the comment section below. I'd love to hear from you. Thank you all so much for watching. Thanks, of course, to the Patreon supporters for your help in bringing these videos to you. I really do appreciate it. To everyone else, thank you for watching, liking, sharing, and subscribing if you felt this video was worth it. I'll see you all in the next one. And until then, as always, live long and prosper.